Morning, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight and taking time out of your busy schedules for this first formal community conversation on a new neighborhood proposal that would be located near San Quentin Village. It's called the Village at Oak Hill. My name is Mike McGuire and I'm honored to be able to work with you as State Senator representing Marin and I am so grateful for the opportunity to be co-hosting tonight's community meeting in this collaborative conversation with my partner here, Assemblymember Mark Levine. Uh, we're gonna hear from the Assemblymember in just a few moments, but I just wanna take a moment, acknowledge the Assemblymember, his tenacious work on behalf of the North Bay. And it's always good to see you, Assemblyman. Thank you so much uh, for your partnership tonight. I would like to be able to quickly lay out the run of show for this evening uh, and provide a brief, a, a brief project description, knowing that we're gonna do a deep dive on this new neighborhood proposal in just a few moments. The Village at Oak Hill neighborhood proposal would provide approximately 115 units of affordable workforce homes for hardworking teachers and school support staff and Marin County employees and 115 units for dedicated essential workers uh, in Marin County, the North Bay. All of these units would be built on state land, 100% of the educational units will be dedicated to Marin County teachers, school support staff, and county workers. You heard that right, 100% of all units. Now, our neighbors in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties have paved the way for this type of project, demonstrating the need for housing for educational staff. After building out educational educator housing in those two communities, the school district and the community's college district realized some positive outcomes. Number one, teacher retention rates, they went up. Turnover rate went down. Student success in the classroom increased. And recruitment costs in Santa Clara was reduced by approximately $250,000 per year. There are massive benefits living where you work. And as we know, over 60% of Marin's workforce drive from out of county into county each and every day. And we know this is simply not sustainable. Now tonight you're gonna to hear from a series of speakers and we are so grateful that they've joined us tonight. We have the Department of General Services with us this evening and his name is Jason Kinney. Uh, they are the point for the state on this project and they also lead, they lead uh, on all real estate transactions for the state of California. Mr. Kinney is gonna to talk to us about how we got here, how the site was chosen and how the affordable housing developers were selected. We'll also hear directly from the nonprofit affordable housing development teams on all aspects of this proposed new uh, neighborhood. They'll provide a full briefing on the specifics of the development. They'll talk about where we're at on the process. And as some member of the Bean and I promise you we're very early in on this process. They're gonna talk with us about what to expect in the weeks and months to come. And they'll talk about that project timeline as well. We also have the hardest working county superintendent of schools in the entire state of California with us tonight. And you know her, her name is Mary Jane Burke. She's gonna focus on the importance of this project for the greater Marin educator community. Once we hear from all of our panelists, we're gonna hear from each and every one of you. And this is the most important part of tonight. We know neighbors are concerned about potential increased traffic and density. Some have view shed concerns. We have dozens upon dozens of questions that have been submitted this evening. We're gonna dive into those questions in just a few moments. The Senator Levine will be taking the lead on that. And we're also gonna be taking your questions live tonight. If you'd like to submit a question now, we're gonna be taking your questions, your comments, your concerns at senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. Email us your live questions right now, senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. We're gonna to try to get to as many as possible here uh, in the next hour or so. All right, let's jump into it and turn this community meeting over to Assembly Member Mark Levine, our partner uh, in tonight's event. Assembly Member, love working with you. Thank you so much for your partnership. And I'll turn the floor over to you, sir. Well, thank you so much. Good evening. And again, thank you, Senator McGuire, for your partnership. I'm grateful to have you be a part of this tonight. I'm Mark Levine. I'm proud to represent Marin County in the Assembly since 2012. Thank you all for joining us. Tonight, we will be discussing an important topic for many, housing. 
The development of state-owned property for the purpose of building affordable housing, the village at Oak Hill, is an important opportunity for our community. And when I say our community, I know what I'm talking about. I live just down Sir Francis Drake Boulevard in Greenbrae. The village will be located on Sir Francis Drake Boulevard between Larkspur Ferry Terminal and San Quentin State Prison. It's important that we have quality housing for our county workforce right here in the North Bay to reduce traffic congestion, congestion and related carbon emissions. And when I visit our schools, I'm often approached by teachers who thank me for my advocacy to open the third eastbound lane on the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. It helps them get home to their families earlier each evening. But imagine if they could live on this side of the bridge, it would be a game changer and a life changer for many. This one opportunity won't solve all of our challenges and there are others we must seize to help our visible homeless with permanent supportive housing. But the village at Oak Hill is an important start. We all have many questions about how Oak Hill will address issues impacting us. And tonight is one part of recognizing and addressing these issues. Now, I would like to introduce the Superintendent of Schools, Mary Jane Burke. Mary Jane will discuss the critical need for educator and support staff housing and how living where you work makes our schools stronger. Mary Jane. Great, thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. So today, October 28th, 50 days into this school year, there are still 317 vacancies in the public schools of Marin County. What are those positions? Teachers, speech therapists, custodians, paraprofessionals, food, food service workers, psychologists, bus drivers, just to name a few. And this is not for the lack of trying. What have we been doing? We've had job pairs. We've had direct recruitment. We've had widespread advertising. We've increased some salaries. We put post-it notes on our local paper. We provided support for people who want to get a credential, personal refer referrals, outreach to universities and colleges. So I want you to know that the lack of affordable housing and the high cost of living in Marin County is the number one issue that is affecting our public schools ability to hire and retain educators to do the most important work in the world. Because what we know is that when you invest in your children, you're investing in the future. So that's why I'm excited to be here tonight. I think we have a great opportunity with the, this particular project and we're gonna hear a lot of details. So let me ask you this, is there a need? Well, 300, 317 vacancies. Well, that tells you there's definitely a need. There were 450 Marin County educators who recently did a survey. 78% of those indicated that they had to commute into Marin. Why? Because there's no way it would be affordable for them to live there. 58% said that the ability, inability to find affordable housing has them in a position that they will likely leave the public schools of Marin within three years. 63% said yes when asked if they considered leaving their current job to get to a place where they could actually afford to live. And no surprise, 87% of those 450 said that they would definitely want to stay here in Marin County in the event that they could find affordable housing. There's other numbers that speak to this issue as well. So as you're, we're all aware, uh, to buy a home now in Marin County, an average $1.7 million. And to put that in perspective, that's $500,000 more than the average was just three years ago. And at this point, the median rent for a one-bedroom apartment in Marin County is now $3,000 a month. That's up $700 a month in the last three years. So to put it in perspective, imagine for a moment, you're a teacher, a beginning teacher, making $55,000 a year. It would require 65% of that teacher's income to just be able to live in that one bedroom apartment. So we're gonna get details about how many units will be available and that's gonna make such a difference but I want you to know that when we think about income eligibility, that based on the information that we're looking at for low to moderate, 
over half of the educators that work in Marin County will be eligible. I want to repeat that half of the Marin County uh, educators will be eligible. So there'll be a lot of demand. So let me just tell you about one of them. Um, I want you to picture Monday, just this last Monday. And if you can remember it for a minute, there was a storm, right? This raging storm was going on. And we have a maintenance worker who doesn't live in Marin because he can't afford to live in Marin, but he was there first thing in the morning at 530. And what he was doing was making sure that the schools were safe for both the staff and the students. But not everybody knew that for him to be there at 530, he had to leave his house by four. He had to travel over two bridges because of the, what was happening with the roads. And there he was sitting there, not sitting there, working hard to make sure everything was safe for students and staff. And so I'd want us to think about what this could mean for a professional like that. What would it have been like on that rainy, rainy day in the torrential storm if he was able to get up and start working in his community without that commute? And so I want you all to know that um, from the County Office of Education, that we are very much looking forward to the potential and the execution of this project. So thank you very much, Senator McGuire. Thank you so much. That's Mary Jane Burke, County Superintendent of Schools here in Marin County. Thank you for being here tonight. We're gonna to hear more from the superintendent in just a bit. She let us know all ahead of time that she has another meeting tonight. That's why we call her the hardest working uh, county superintendent in the state at 7.30. She's gonna be with us for as long as she can. All right, we're now gonna be getting into the technical details of this project, and we're grateful that we have Jason Kinney with us. Uh, Mr. Kinney is the Deputy Director of Real Estate Services uh, for uh, the Department of General Services. He oversees the real estate division. He's involved in so much across the state. We wanna say thank you, Mr. Kinney, for your service. He's gonna be talking about the executive order and how we got here why it's being why this development is being proposed to be built on state land he's going to talk about how the land was chosen the specific site uh, and also how the process went about in regards to selecting these nonprofit housing developers mr kenny the floor is yours you have five minutes and we'll give you a 30 second prompt good good, good evening thank you senator mcguire and Assemblymember member levine thank you for the opportunity to present tonight i know that folks would probably rather hear from the developer on specifics so i will definitely make my comments brief um and, and as as senator mcguire mentioned i want to uh, just briefly address how we got here and when governor newsom took office one of his earliest directives was for the state to look really hard at state property that wasn't being utilized to its full potential to repurpose as much of that as possible for housing and to leverage the value of the land in doing so. And that direction was really the beginning of how we got here. The ultimate goal, of course, is to ensure that state government is doing its part to address the state's housing crisis, but also to do so in a way that's sustainable, equitable, and inclusive. And we try to make sure that our projects address area-related needs as well. And in this area, uh, in addition to the, the general need for affordable housing period, Workforce housing has actually been a goal for, for us from day one, and it's a huge part of why this, this site was um, selected for potential development. Um, now, when we, when we have any particular piece of state property that's going to be developed, we do a couple of things. First, we look at overall feasibility. Um, and in this case, we actually partnered with the Turner Center and UC Berkeley, uh, whose graduate program did a conceptual project analysis for the site. And kind of a fun fact on that, we made our entire portfolio of state sites available to UC Berkeley um, to sort of self-select which sites they thought would make great developments. And this is one of uh, three or so that they actually picked themselves without prompting for us. It's, there's a lot of kismet here. Um, beyond feasibility, kind of getting into development details, uh, we also bring in the local governments. Um, and so we've been working, I think, really well with both Marin County and the city of Larkspur from day one. They really have been at the table from day one. Uh, before we ever started the process of selecting a developer, the city and county provided us with site information, aspirational goals. They reviewed our solicitations. It's been a, it's been a true partnership, I think, from the beginning. Um, now, speaking of selecting a developer, I think it may be helpful to note that like our other projects, we do issue a formal public solicitation. Um, we wanna get the right partner. And so we actually start with a request for qualifications and we shortlist to only qualified firms here we actually had four interested uh, developers that we shortlisted. 
Um, and then we issue a request for proposals that is specific to the site, um, leading us to select Eden and Thompson Dorfman in the end as the best overall proposers. Um, and, I, and, and since I know, like you, we're all looking forward to their presentation, um, I just want to conclude by saying that you know after tonight, I hope everyone will share my confidence in Eden and Thompson Dorfman being the right team to get the project across the finish line. Um, and kind of going back to what Superintendent Burke said, you know, we, we really sincerely hope that this project helps support local teachers, really does strengthen the school system here. I think we have an opportunity to leverage this site and the state's overall direction and the land value to really do a lot of good and to be a project that we can all collectively be proud of. So with that, thank you, Senator and Asli member for giving me the opportunity to, to speak. That's Jason Kinney, Deputy Director for the Department of General Services, oversees real estate transactions for the state of California. Mr. Kinney, thank you so much for being with us tonight. He's going to be here with us for the duration, taking your questions, responding to your comments, your concerns, any criticisms that you may have. Uh, and speaking of that, you can also email your questions in live right now, senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. We're taking your questions live tonight. We also have dozens of questions that have been submitted prior. Assembly member Mark Levine is ready to go with those. But if you'd like to uh, email your questions in tonight, senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. The assemblyman and I wanted to make sure that we host this community meeting and a minimum of another community meeting in the spring to discuss this issue and to be able to engage with neighbors and the community. Uh, and we thought it was important to be able to bring together uh, these two nonprofit developers, which we're grateful who are here today. That's Bruce Dorfman from Education Housing Partners and Teddy Newmeyer from Eden Housing. They're gonna be doing the deep dive on this new neighborhood proposal, providing us with all the specifics where they're at in the process, like we said very early on, we are early in this process and they're gonna let us know what to expect in the weeks and months to come. So it is now our pleasure to be able to turn it over to Mr. Dorfman and Mr. Neumeyer uh, to be able to provide uh, a full briefing and we're gonna be going to a PowerPoint now. Good evening, gentlemen. Who's kicking us off? Uh, Mr. Hey, Bruce, can, can you see the, the PowerPoint? Yep, the yep. PowerPoint's up and good. Okay, good. Uh, good evening. On behalf of Eden Housing and Education Housing Partners, I wanted to thank Senator McGuire and Assemblymember Levine and their staffs for tonight's town hall and Superintendent Burke for participating. We are pleased to introduce our Oak Hill Workforce and Affordable Housing Development. If you have comments or questions about this project after the town hall, feel free uh, to contact us at our web project website at oakhillmarin.com. We are interested in your feedback. I would like to start by noting that this rendering is very conceptual in nature. While it has allowed us to do a preliminary scoping in, of the development and test some design concepts, it does not represent the final architecture colors or massing of the project. We are still completing physical due diligence on the site and receiving input from interested parties and that will help to inform the project design. Slide. Um, by way of background, Education Housing Partners is a California public benefit nonprofit corporation and was established by my partner, Will Thompson, and me 17 years ago to help public school districts and other public agencies address a significant operational issue, recruiting and retaining faculty and staff in high cost of living environments. This is achieved by creating high quality housing on surplus land that the districts can offer to their employees at significantly below market rental rates. Joanna Julian is our project manager and is also joining me on this call. Our firm has deep roots in Marin and we have worked and lived in Mill Valley for the better part of 40 years. During this period of time, Thompson Dorfman Partners has developed over 75 multifamily properties containing 17,000 apartments, condominiums, and homes in primarily coastal California communities. Also, we have worked with dozens of school districts throughout the state on workforce housing projects. Shown here are some of the faculty and staff projects that we have built in the Bay Area. Teddy? 
All right, good evening. I'm Teddy Newmeyer. I'm a senior project developer representing Eden Housing, the developer working on the lower income family housing portion of this project. Eden Housing is one of the oldest and most experienced affordable housing organizations in California. We're a mission driven nonprofit serving low income families, seniors, and people living with disabilities. Eden was established uh, over 50 years ago in Hayward, California, and since then have developed, acquired, or rehabbed over 12,000 affordable units. Currently, Eden provides homes to over 22,000 lower income residents in California. Eden's work, go, Eden's work goes beyond uh, building high quality buildings. Uh, we strive to create communities for our residents. Under the Eden umbrella, we have a, uh, a property management company, Eden Housing Property Management, which provides quality on site management and maintenance of our properties. We also have uh, Eden Housing Resident Services, where we offer free on site supportive services and programs to ensure our residents succeed. Together, these integrated companies uh, bring a combined package of experience and expertise, which covers a spectrum of activities involved in developing, owning, managing, and servicing high quality housing development. So Eden, Eden uh, as I mentioned, works uh, in over 15 counties across the state, um, including extensive experience uh, in Marin. Uh, you can see here a picture of Warner Creek in Nevada, which, which we recently finished, and then Whistle Stop uh, in San Rafael, which we are hoping to, to, to start construction on soon. Um, and I know I think uh, Bruce also mentioned a lot of his uh, work in, in Marin, and you can talk about that a little bit more here. Um, locally, uh, we have advised an institutional investor and managed the design, community outreach, and entitlement on the successful redevelopment of Black Home in Marina. We are presently working on the revitalization of Mallard Point in Belvedere, in which we are proposing rebuilding and expanding the property by 20 units, in which a dozen would be either deeded affordable, ADUs, or affordability by design, in order to create an environmentally sustainable and resilient community. The Oak Hill site is a very compelling property for multifamily development. It is a previously developed surplus site controlled by the state and part of the San Quentin complex on the north side of Sir Francis Drake. It is located in Marin's one true transit node that features bus, ferry, and rail service, as well as a major pedestrian and bicycle path. It offers easy access to both the 101 and 580 corridors, as well as to shopping and services. Further, this central location in the county gives it convenient access for school and county employees throughout Marin. Finally, with sensitive design, we will provide residents high quality housing with wonderful bay views and direct access to the terrific lifestyle that we all cherish in Marin. So as has been mentioned, uh, I want to remind everyone that these designs are preliminary. Um, obviously, we're, we're uh, a lot of things that are going to are affect the design, including comments from all of you. We're also working around various site restrictions. That's including a, a, a large sewer easement that goes through the center of the site. Um, and various other access uh, access restrictions that we're working on. But we are uh, working on updating these designs to make a, a feasible and aesthetically pleasing design that nicely terraces into the hill side and provides great homes and amenities for our residents. Uh, the site is gonna be approximately five acres and we'll have 230 to 250 units. 150 of those units um, will be uh, developed and owned by Eden for lower income family, uh, family units. Uh, and then 115 to 135 of those units will be developed and owned by education and housing partners. We're gonna share infrastructure, including a parking garage, which will have about one and a half spaces per unit, as well as other landscaped exterior amenities, including community gardens and, and play areas. Um, being along Sir Francis Drake, uh, we're, we're conducting traffic studies with, with a firm called WTRANS to determine the best solutions for traffic flow in and out of in the site. Uh, these studies will include uh, looking at pedestrian and bike access to the, to the path across for Sir Francis Drake, and we're considering uh, pedestrian or traffic signal options. Um, again, the, the unit mix for the, uh, for, for the, for the lower income units is going to be a, a mix, a pretty even mix right now of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedroom units. Um, and the, the, uh, Educator housing portion will have uh, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedroom units. Uh, and the estimated development cost currently is about $150 million to $175 million. Um, in addition, uh, here's, here's some 
pictures of, of uh, what, what the interiors will look like in some of the amenity areas. Um, for example, that's a kitchen from a, from a recent Eden project. Um, and we, we also, but both, both sites will have uh, bike rooms with bike equipment. Um, we've got a photo there of, of a computer lab, which is heavily used for a lot of the Eden services that we provide, um, community rooms, uh, fitness centers, uh, both, both portions of the project will have and have access to. Great. Uh, one thing I just want to clarify is that um, Education Housing Partners actually will not own the uh, teacher housing that will be owned by, and the uh, county housing that's going to be owned by an entity created uh, between MCOE, uh, the County Office of Education, and the county itself. Um, with regard to time frame, um, it should be noted that the state is the lead agency for processing environmental review, design, building permits, and issuing the certificate of occupancy. Um, as mentioned, we are still in the early stages of this process and completing due diligence, preparing reports required for CEQA, and seeking community input. We hope to complete the initial design work in the spring of next year, uh, and that hopefully will dovetail with another town hall meeting. Uh, so we can present that design uh, to the community. We also uh, are looking to commence construction at the beginning of 2023 with a project completion by mid-2025. So I'm sure after this, we're going to have a lot of questions answered tonight, and I, and I don't think the questions are going to stop there. So we want to just provide you with some some additional information, uh, you can visit our, our website at oakhillmarin.com. Um, you'll see there, there's a, a place to sign up for an interest list um, where you can sign up for, for future updates. You can sign up if you're an interested uh, resident um, and you can also uh, submit comments there. Um, as we mentioned, you can also submit comments to oakhill at edenhousing.org. Um, and we plan on having a similar town hall to this in the spring. So with that, I wanna again, thank Thanks, Senator McGuire, Assembly Member Levine, um, Jason Kenny, Mary Jane Burke, and uh, I will pass it back to them. And we'll solve some questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Teddy and Bruce and and uh, Jason um, and Mary Jane. Uh, we've got a lot of questions, and you wouldn't be surprised, and you shouldn't be surprised to know that the as I've been putting them into buckets, traffic is probably the most frequently raised question uh, that we have received. And I know in uh, earlier in this presentation, we talked a little bit about the traffic studies. Um, and so I, you know, to try to put all those questions together instead of, you know, trying to piecemeal them all out, kind of where are we in those studies? Um, what, what are, you know, even if we're early, those potential options, you know, one person, for example, thought there might be a flyover um, you know, so if we, are there any perceptions or misperceptions, I'd love to be able to, to knock that out as someone who takes kids to school every day on Sir Francis Drake. I I'm also pretty sensitive to traffic, but I also recognize people are already coming over that bridge. And if we bring them here, um, we're not increasing, um, traffic at all potentially, um, on that, on that part of Sir Francis Drake. So, um, who wants to take the lead on on that? And if I'm not getting what some people are looking for, I'll I'll, I'll ask. Teddy, why don't I uh, start with that? So again, you know, the CEQA protocol is now looking at VMT or vehicle miles traveled. So um, as Superintendent Burke mentioned, many of her or many of the district, various school district employees are commuting into town. To the extent that we can shorten those commutes, we are actually going to have a positive effect on VMT. And we are currently in the process of completing a traffic study, but our general sense is just based on uh, that factor that so many people are commuting into Marin that we will actually have a positive impact, impact overall on traffic. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned environmental review. Um, a really great question, and I know the person who put the, this question in um, asked about the, the, the risk and, and the fear of the unit count getting uh, pushed down um, in that review. Is that is that reality or is that not something that could occur? 
Uh, I, I, I can Jason, you. that's you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So you're, you're asking, you know, are, um, what's the likelihood of the unit count going down? Yeah, could that happen? Have you seen that in other projects on DGS property that uh, an environmental review was done? There are some environmental concerns and therefore the unit unit count had to be dropped down, maybe because of the traffic issues that were raised or something else. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's absolutely a, a possibility. Um, you know, part of the, 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 the backbone of CEQA is to understand what the impacts are, to characterize them in terms of the level of significance and then mitigate them. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, mitigations are supposed to be, you know, what is, you know, possible, feasible. Um, and so, it, you know, reduction in units, if that has a direct uh, uh, relationship to the, the significance of the impact is, is would possibly absolutely possible under CEQA. But, but I think, uh, you know, as I look at this project, I, I feel as though, to Bruce's point about vehicle miles traveled, we could probably be reducing them significantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that would be uh, the likelihood of that unit reduction would be slim. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not um, convinced that that would be a likely outcome, uh, okay. but it is possible. And obviously, we've got to take the environmental impact seriously as we do that review. The, interestingly enough, I think that the driver of that question was, we don't have enough units. This isn't enough units either. And, and, and I think that's the ethos of, of, of where that was coming from. And so, um, you know, in a, in a pre-meeting, uh, Jason and I had raised, you know, how can we shake out some more property from DGS for these wonderful uh, projects? And I hope that message was relayed to you because I know that you had to miss that, that call that we did. Um, but is there a pipeline of more of these types of projects? In particular, this was asked for, for school staff um, and, and maybe the superintendent might have a, a key, a window into the future. Or in yeah, Jason, if you know about yeah, that. If you're, yeah, for, in terms of the state properties, I can say, I mean, we, we actually looked at over 44,000 properties statewide. Um, and we have a pipeline of about a hundred properties also statewide um, that are in the queue and, and more get added. Um, and so, you know, uh, we, we definitely try to do this around the state. Um, is it possible more would happen in the area? We'd love to see more happen in the area. Um, but um, yeah, we're focused on this one, obviously, right now. And so just to add to that, definitely our hope is that this is, this is ground zero, step one. It's very successful and we are continuing to move forward because we definitely need this. And obviously you're right, this is not enough, but you have to start somewhere. So. Uh, this will be our ground zero for this effort. That's right. And, and hopefully a very positive um, development for us to look at and say this can be, we can do this again. Um, before I toss this back to our senator, who's got, I'm sure, a lot of live questions saying, Mark didn't ask the question I wanted asked. Um, <laughs> uh, I do, another really interesting issue came up, which was, you know, when we're trying to prioritize a certain group of workers, how will we expect any fair housing laws to bump up against our ability to um, to help select people for this housing that is so badly needed, not just for the teacher community or the county employee community, uh, but so many people who are struggling with housing? Sure. Um, so again, the only criteria uh, that uh, is used um, to screen applicants for the faculty and staff housing is employment either by a school district, um, county uh, office, or uh, the county of Marin. So just based upon that, there's no other elements uh, that are factored into it other than county of Marin to see what types of priorities they want to provide. Uh, for example, other school districts have use this for recruiting and retainage. So it's generally being oriented first to new employees coming in, but that's not a mandate. And we will be working with the county uh, and with MCOE uh, to come up with some sort of a lottery system uh, for these units. All right, thank you very much. And, and Senator, I can go all night, but I wanna give you a chance to pipe in um, with some questions, sir. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. Uh, and again, we are we have a slew of questions that were submitted prior, uh, over 200, in fact, uh, prior uh, to tonight's uh, community meeting. And we are taking your questions live here tonight as well. If you'd like to be able to ask a question, share a comment, a concern, 
feel free to email us, senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. Let's go to our live questions, and this is coming in from David. I'm going to direct this to the superintendent and to Mr. Dorfman, as Mr. Dorfman is lead for all issues on the educator uh, side of the neighborhood. Uh, Madam Superintendent, David asks, aside from generalized surveys of district employees about a need for more affordable housing, has any specific inquiry been made of district employees about how many would apply to lease a unit uh, at this specific development at Oak Hill? Uh, Superintendent Burke, and then we'll go to Mr. Dorfman. So nothing specific that I'm aware of, but we do have the data that was specifically to school employees that did ask them um, if there was affordable housing available in the county, would you be interested in it? And that was an 87% yes. Bruce, I don't know if you have anything to add. Well, I can only speak from uh, our experience with other districts, and that is that of the total employee base, um, number one, uh, the interest has been about at least 10% of the total employee base of other districts that we've worked with. And number two, there's been a waiting list at each one of the teacher housing, uh, teacher and staff housing projects that we've created. Mm -hmm. So to put a number on that, that would be 600 uh, people if we got to the 10% number. Thank you so much, Superintendent Burke. And of course, that's Bruce Dorfman, uh, lead for Education Housing Partners. Uh, Mr. Dorfman, we're going to stick with you for a moment. Kimberly writes in, how will teachers in low-income families enroll to be considered for one of these units? So that's going to be the, one of the top questions is how do folks secure one of these units? Mr. Dorfman, then we'll go to Mr. Neumeyer. So as we're working through the organization of the Joint Powers Authority that will be owning uh, this asset. We will be working directly with MCOE and the county uh, to create a process uh, uh, for selection, um, generally involves a lottery, uh, but uh, we will rely upon MCOE and the county to inform their employees of uh, that process. And then let's go to the essential worker side of the development. Mr. Neumeyer, how will residents be selected for one of these units? So similarly, we will have a, we'll have a lottery um, for our selection process, but um, in order to, to, to join that lottery, we when we're getting towards the end of our construction process, we will um, publicize, publicize how, uh, publicize the project, publicize how you can, and can enter the lottery um, and what that, that consists of. Uh, as, as I think I mentioned earlier, if you're interested in staying up to date on that kind of thing, um, you, can, you can go on our website, and just uh, give us, give us your, your email address and we'll keep you up to date on, on uh, those on events with, with regards to, to leasing these units. Um, so, so I think if, you, if you're interested, that's, that's what I recommend you do. Thank you, Mr. Neumeyer. Thank you, Mr. Dorfman. Uh, we're going to go to a comment here and uh, happy to have Mr. Kinney chime in on this as well. Then I'm gonna turn it back to the assembly member for uh, questions as well. Uh, this comes in from Sarah. Uh, Sarah says, and this is a statement, uh, the Marin public needs to know that this Village Oak Hill development will not be paying property taxes and that all expenses of public services will be the burden of taxpayers. The cost will be on all of us. Well. I'll just start off here, Sarah, and just say this. Uh, right now, uh, there are no affordable units on that site. Uh, and I think we need to take a look at the future. We need to take a look at the future of this county. 60% of its workforce, of Marin County's workforce, drives in every day. We can't say that we're for taking climate action if we aren't supportive of additional smart development opportunities in this county right now. And as the assembly member just said, if we can get folks to live where they work, those carbon emissions will be reduced year after year. And what we've seen in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties, retention goes up for teachers, turnover goes down, and success in the classroom is increased. So I, I gotta say, also the state doesn't pay property tax already. So it's public land. So uh, I, I don't know if uh, Mr. Kinney wants to be able to chime in on this. And the last thing I'll also say, this is very common. We're working on a development right now in the city of Novato, 49 units of, uh, for homeless veterans. The city of Novato is providing the land and the state, the county, and the Marine Community Foundation is funding the development. 
This is a very common practice because the cost of dirt in Marin and in the Bay Area uh, is so damn expensive. To be able to get these units built, to be able to get teachers housed, to be able to get essential workers housed, we have to find innovative solutions. But Mr. Kinney, I don't know if you want to chime in on this, and then I'm going to go to the superintendent, and we're going to go back to the assemblyman. Uh, Mr. Kinney. Yeah, it's uh, uh, happy to address the comments, um, and it is a complicated subject, um, but trying to simplify it down to your point, Senator, right now the county essentially assesses zero taxes on it because it's state property, so there is no tax revenue coming in. Um, but you know there is there is case law on on these sorts of developments, and um, you know there are categories of taxes that the property would be subject to. So I don't think it's it's accurate to say that there wouldn't be anything. Um, there there generally will be, um, and um, you know it's something that gets it gets developed uh, along with the development itself over time. On potential improvements in the future yeah. development of the site. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. Superintendent, we're going to do sixty seconds if that's all right, and then we're going to go right back to the assembly. Right I, didn't, I didn't have anything to add to that. Well, right. nope. Hey, there we go. We got an amen from uh, Mary Jane Burke. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go back to the assembly. Yeah, thank you. And I, you know, another point about the the land um, from the state. It's essentially a gift to our community to be able to use it for something our community so badly needs, and uh, and and we have to recognize that for for what it is but also the economic vitality that it can also generate when we use it for this purpose. And, uh, but the important thing is local consultation. And, uh, and so we do have a lot of questions about that. Um, you know, this is kind of a, a state project. A lot of this is being run through the Department of General Services, the Environmental Review, so many things that we expect city councils to do. Jason, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you've been engaged with the city of Larkspur and, how you've been engaged with the county and, and of course also the, the office of education um, to make sure that local consultation is in place uh, please yeah sure so um, when we do these projects um, and trying to be brief um, you know obviously um, we we own the site but everything that happens off site is is not within our purview we can't require the locals to do certain things and so um, there has to be a partnership on day one um, you know utilities off-site improvements those sorts of things those conversations happen we also are really clear when we come in and do these projects that we don't want to do something that is, you know, foreign and alien. Uh, we want to do something that fits the context, meets local needs, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and so, you know, a big part of that is the conversations with county and cities on, on what that would look like, what's appropriate for the area, um, how we can meet some of those needs. Um, we make our solicitations available to them for review and comment before they ever go out. Uh, we often offer uh, the local government, actually, we, not often, we always offer local governments to sit at the table in the selection of developers as well. Um, and they're a partner after selection um, and in the same way, wanting to make sure that as we're going down this path, we're doing so together. Um, these are state properties, these are state developments, but at the same point in time, you know, it's in someone's backyard. It's 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 in a community and, and we have to recognize that. And I think we, we deliberately attempt to be inclusive because of that reality. Well, thank you for that recognition. I know that's very important to uh, my friends who are members of the, the Larkspur City Council and Mayor Kevin Haroff, who, who specifically wanted to be sure that that was communicated to the, those concerned who are participating tonight. Another interesting issue, it's not unique to Marin, uh, is the issue of water. And so uh, we have a question about, you know, 115, 230 water hookups. Oh my gosh. And I think it is important to note that these units of housing are probably going to be some of the lowest users of water in the entire state. Uh, and you know, if, if you'd like to, anyone wants to make any commentary about that, uh, this is about as responsible as we can be to develop um, this type of housing. But you know, if, if there's more detail that will make people who are watching feel a little bit better because we, we are under, you know, even, even with this past week, under the impression that water will be scarce for a long time to come. Um, I would just add that, uh, and although I totally agree with what you just mentioned, Assemblyman, um, that our focus is that we have a, th a three-pronged approach. The projects have to be socially sustainable, they have to be economically sustainable, and they have to be environmentally sustainable. And relative to that third prong, as it relates to um, higher density multifamily communities, they do use less water. We are going to be uh, incorporating a whole host of uh, energy and water efficiency features throughout the project 
Um, and um, I'd finally note that a big part of it is also uh, involving submetering of water, which uh, encourages uh, our residents uh, to track uh, their use as well, uh, because they will be billed back directly for it. So I think that on uh, you know a variety of fronts, it will be a very efficient project, not just from water use, but also from energy consumption use across the board. Great, thank you for that. There is uh, acronym alert, uh, RENA, Regional Housing Needs Allocation. So every eight years, communities across the state are given a goal of how many units of housing they need to build to support uh, the communities as they grow. Um, there's a, a really good question um, from Lily that came in about how do we allocate these units? Um, it's in the county, it's in the Larkspur sphere of influence. Larkspur's you know, likely to annex this property. Who gets credit for this? And does it matter? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, technically, it, uh, the intent is for this property to be um, annexed into Larkspur. It's in their sphere of influence. Uh, at the same time, I think there are discussions going on between the county and the city of Larkspur regarding that issue. Yeah. All right. That's good. Um, all right. You want to take some more live questions, Senator? Thank you so much, Assembly Member. Uh, and again, we are so appreciative that you have joined us tonight uh, to each and every one of you. We're talking about a new neighborhood proposal uh, right near the village of San Quentin. Uh, and uh, it would be 230 units, half dedicated to teachers, uh, school support staff, county workers, and the other half, essential workers. And that gets us to Teddy Newmeyer. Um, Amy Cole writes in, uh, to Mr. Newmeyer and Eden Housing, that's who he's representing, would be responsible for the development of the essential worker portion of this affordable housing development. Mr. Newmeyer, uh, Amy asks, who are you considering essential workers? Yeah, I think that um, our, our our focus is on on lower income families. I think that we find that, uh, uh, that those often tend to be you know what, what's been recently as the pandemic's gone on uh, described as essential workers, but this is um, not necessarily uh, uh, only for essential workers. I think that 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 our main criteria is is based on on income. So we we're targeting um, families and, and individuals from thirty to sixty percent of, of AMI, um, and and we find that those those often fall into categories that that are often um, we consider essential workers. So 30 to 60 percent of area median income. So I'm just going to throw out some potential professions, and you let me know if you think I'm correct. Uh, it would be uh, grocery clerk workers. It could be healthcare workers, for example. Uh, it could be folks who work with local government or in schools. Um, correct, uh, Mr. Newmeyer? I think we we find that folks in all of those professions do often live in in our properties, and we we see that as being in the the case in this one as well. So yes. I want to stick to who would qualify uh, within the Eden housing portion of this. Kay writes in, are police, fire, and other emergency services part of the conversation and planning for the units? Uh, Mr. Newmeyer. I think they, they certainly all are. I, I can't pretend to know exactly what their incomes are. I, I can tell you, um, for example, uh, for a, for a two-bedroom unit, family of four, um, our 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 units will will serve families making between fifty four thousand and about one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year. So and and they'll be paying about you know fifteen or twelve hundred to twenty five hundred dollars a month for those units. So um, you know I think I think that that gives you a good idea. Obviously with with some bigger units or, or smaller family sizes, those change. But you know, fifty to one hundred thousand dollars a year is, is often kind of the median for a two bedroom unit there. That's Teddy Newmeyer. He is representing Eden Housing today. Eden Housing would build 150 units, half of the proposed new neighborhood. I now want to be able to go to Mr. Dorfman. Mr. Dorfman would be lead on all issues for the educational side of the development. Another 115 units. This next question comes in from David. Uh, does this project still envision 400 plus minus cars parked on the property? And if so, wouldn't the ingress and egress of those cars dwarf any overall vehicle miles travel benefit? 
So Mr. Dorfman, I, I know that it's something that you and Mr. Newmeyer and the teams are really digging into in regards to traffic flow. That's a concern uh, of the neighbors. So talk about that and what are some ideas that you have out there? Sure. Um, well, first off, there is this tension between providing parking and vehicle trips. There's a desire, obviously, to reduce uh, the reliance upon um, uh, automobiles. And, you know, one way we do that is by citing these types of properties close to mass transit, which this property benefits from. Uh, but then taking it a step further, we are looking at a number of different things, including a signalized intersection at our entry. Uh, so that we cannot just get cars in and out of our community, but also uh, provide pedestrian access to the uh, ped bike path that's on the south side of Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. That's Bruce Dorfman. Uh, thank you so much, sir. We're going to go to a comment. Joanne writes in saying, I support creating 230 homes for essential workers, teachers, and school support staff. Uh, this is a unique opportunity for affordable housing that is sorely needed. Thank you so much uh, for writing in, Joanne. Last question before I go back to the assemblyman, uh, and want to encourage you, we have uh, some time left here tonight. If you'd like to be able to ask a question, provide a comment, provide a criticism. We look forward to hearing from you. Senator.McGuire at Senate.ca.gov. Email your questions, comments, concerns, criticisms now to senator.mcguire at senate.ca.gov. All right, Mr. Dorfman, Mr. Newmeyer, uh, feel free to chime in, both of you. Uh, this comes in from Jeffrey. Jeffrey says, St. Quentin has been envisioned as a potential rail ferry terminal site in transit-oriented community since the Peter Calthrop study in 2002. Is further study of this idea warranted as a next step following village at Oak Hill? Mr. Dorfman, then Mr. Neumeyer. Um, well, I suppose that's a bigger policy uh, question for uh, the county itself. But uh, from my perspective, absolutely. Um, this obviously is not part of the Calthorpe study, um, but uh, it's something that's been uh, kicked around for quite a while in the county. And at some point in time, I suppose the uh, prison becomes obsolete. But I have no idea. And perhaps uh, uh, Mr. Kinney would uh, be able to comment on that as well. And I think that uh, we're probably going to hear from Mr. Member Levine on that issue as well, as he's been championing that one. Uh, but quickly, Mr. Newmeyer, 60 seconds on this issue, if you'd like, and then we're going to go to a similar Member Mark Levine. Uh, Mr. Newmeyer. Yeah, I think that, that Bruce said it well, and, and I think that Eden is, is really focused on this project, and we think that we're, we're, we're very supportive of of doing what we can to add to the uh, the, the transit-oriented development of that area. You know, there's already ferry and bus terminals in the area, and we'd like to, to make sure that our, our residents uh, use that as, as, as much as they can. Um, I think that to the extent that there's more development in, in that around it, um, we're, we're also very supportive. Teddy Newmeyer representing Eden Housing. We're now going to turn it back to a similar member, Mark Levine. He has literally dozens of questions in front of him, trying to get to as many as possible. We're going to ask our panelists to do a little bit of a lightning round just to try to get as many questions as possible. 30 to 60 seconds for answers. A similar member, the floor is yours. Yeah, some of these questions are, are more complicated uh, that we want to make sure we have uh, some thoughtful uh, pers perspectives shared. Um, and my internet is starting to get glitchy as my kids uh, are starting to stream a lot more, uh, which I hope isn't a problem for everyone else, but I've, I've noticed a few problems. Um, living here in the community, I share some of Blanche's concerns. Um, she talked about the architecture being, you know, and how that's being used and designed. And I think that a lot of that, for those of us that live in central Marin, was born from uh, what many people call the wind cup development or the Tamil Ridge development that began and then stopped. Uh, and I think there were some financial hurdles that it had, but also some very poor design review choices that were made early on uh, that a decade out, it doesn't look as bad as it looked in year three. They, they made some changes, but it was a very slow and, and belabored process to have that be built. I personally feel heartened hearing from Bruce and Teddy uh, about, you know, the work that they've done, that this is going to get done in a timely manner, uh, and that you can take, um, you know, how does this, you know, fit into the community, uh, in, into, um, into mind in a way that perhaps wasn't done at the outset on that other project. Um, care to 
I can't speak to the wing cup development or won't speak to it, but I will speak to our process. And first off, both firms are very focused on quality of design. Uh, we brought in a wonderful architect, SBA, uh, out of um, Oakland uh, to help us uh, uh, design a project that is going to be contextual and frankly, uh, very pleasing. I would take it a step further and say, go to our website if you have concerns and look at the projects that we built. They're all high quality. They have been award winning. And most importantly, the residents and the surrounding communities like having them in the neighborhood. Yeah, and, and as Jason said, you were shortlisted uh, as qualified uh, developers. Um, so, you know, there's, we can always point to Jason. <laughs> Jason, can you talk about what, how do you make that list? How do you, you know, how did we figure out that, hey, these are the high quality developers um, that can plan something like this, that, that we need to, you know, take those, those proposals? Yeah, I mean, we're we're looking at um, their their development shops, so uh, you know projects of commensurate size, complexity. Uh, looking at their um, work in the area, we're looking at their you know financial fe uh, feasibility, not just in the project itself, but we're also looking at what they're proposing, the likelihood of being getting, getting it off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at you know their their sense of the community and what the outreach process is going to look like. Um, so we're, we're looking at those elements, I think, that, that really you know, show us that we've got a developer who, who can deliver something uh, on its face. And then the RFP itself, uh, you know, obviously they propose a specific project that we're evaluating for even further. Yeah, we don't know what the future holds, but we, we have housing that is old. You know, we have very old housing stock in Marin. Um, but we look at other developments like Golden Gate Village that has, you know, maybe met its its best, you know, seen its best years and needs a lot of um, work to, to maintain that quality. Uh, the question from Blanche also included a question about, you know, how can we make sure that this is something that's gonna last and, and be built solidly for, for generations? I mean, if you want to... Yeah, I think that from Eden, Eden's perspective, you know, we take pride in, in building building projects that are built uh, in, in, with, with, with good materials, sturdy materials that are going to hold up for a long time. And then we also have our, our in-house management team. And so, so we you know, are, are, are very proactive in making sure that our buildings are well-maintained um, and, and, and can, can withstand for uh, their lifetimes. Yeah, and so that, that building management is important. We want it to be high quality housing. And when, if a tenant has an issue, uh, that those things get resolved, whether it's a water leak, a plumbing issue, electricity, um, that those are meeting the highest standards for members of our community. And I would just add that um, MCOE and the county are long-term owners uh, of these, of our portion of the project. And uh, because of that, what we're trying to do is keep um, our costs as low as possible, our long-term operating costs. Um, and by building a quality project up front helps to do that. Um, because the rents are directly reflective of uh, the operating costs. So the lower uh, the operating costs are, the lower the rents. Well, as a taxpayer, I also thank you for making it easy to take care of, uh, you know, locally owned uh, developments like that. Um, to that point, and, and I think, you know, to the, the things that held up uh, other developments mid-process, the question from Ron was, what are the funding sources? So we know we got a gift of the land. Where is the other money coming from? And, you know, really what is, you know, we talked about it in big, big amounts, but you know, kind of what are those stacks of money as, the, as Ron had described them? Bruce, do you want to start? All right, I can go. No. Yeah, so so uh, the affordable housing development, we, uh, like like most of Eden's projects, will will utilize the low-income housing tax credit. Um, and then I think that these these change from time to time, but, but HCD, uh, the state's housing community development, Department um, also often has many funding sources that we'll, we'll utilize. We're looking at one called Multifamily Housing Program (MHP), um, and then there's 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 many others. So so I think between those tax credits and, and other uh, state sources, as well as a, a kind of a standard permanent loan, we'll, we'll uh, round out kind of how we plan on funding this project. And of course, couldn't be done without the the land donation that we're grateful for. Well, when you mention a permanent loan, does that mean that you don't have to pay it back because it's permanently loaned out? Can you describe that? No, that's a, that's a standard, you know, standard loan like an, anyone else uh, can get. So, um, so yeah, so that is a, a loan that we will have to pay off. I don't have an opinion. Uh, Bruce, did you want to comment on that? I was just going to say, relative to our component of it, we're looking at funding a tax exempt bond. 
Uh, as I previously mentioned, uh, the rents are set at levels that cover the principal and interest on the debt, as well as operating costs in a reserve. And so um, the lower the cost of debt service, the lower the rents implicitly. So um, we're also looking at other uh, avenues for um, equity investment, so to speak, either tax credits or, again, uh, to the extent that uh, 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 the senator or assembly member can uh, uh, scrounge up some funds to invest in this, that will help. Okay, I'm going to dig deep into my pockets there. Um, there's, I don't have an opinion on the name. The village at, at Oak Hill is lovely, but I think that um, Kathy asked a question that I think maybe there's a confusion about San Quentin Village. So this is not at San Quentin Village. Just to clarify, this is between um, uh, the Larch Ferry Terminal and San Quentin. Um, her question was regarding whether San Quentin Beach will still be open for people who don't live in San Quentin Village, and this doesn't have any impact on that. And I wanted to make that clear to anyone uh, that was uh, had that misperception. So thank you. Senator McGuire. Thank you so much, Assembly Member Balright. We are going back to our live questions here. Thank you for emailing us. So we're going to try to get to as many as possible. Let's hear from Ms. Flores. Ms. Flores writes in, uh, we have teaching staff that are part of the disabled community. Is there any way to include units for this population? I know four teachers in the disability community that would appreciate a home. So Mr. Dorfman, let's talk about that. Uh, Talk about universal design here and for someone that may have physical disabilities and being able to live in that educator housing. Uh, what would you say to Ms. Flores? Oh, first off, 100% um, of the project will be uh, accessible um, uh, to disabled uh, residents. So I think that's uh, the answer. But uh, uh, certainly the units are all made to accommodate uh, uh, people with handicaps. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Dorfman. This is a comment coming in from Karen. Uh, Karen says, I think it's unrealistic to assume that anyone housed in the apartments is currently driving uh, and coming across the bridge. So it's disingenuous to make an assertion that seems to allege the number of people who reside in the apartments will not add to traffic. That's Karen coming in with a comment. And like we said, we're going to take any and all comments here tonight or criticisms as well. So thank you so much, Karen. Uh, Actually, if I could respond to that, um, our project at College Vista, which was 44 units, uh, the um, San Mateo Community College District determined that those residents commuted a quarter million miles less per year by moving to that community. So I would uh, say that uh, there is no question that residents will drive less because they will be moving from much further away. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Dorfman, uh, based off of previous development and study off of that. Uh, another comment has come in from Cynthia. Cynthia says this is a great location at Housing and Marin. It's accessible to many work sites via public transportation. As surplus government property, it's appropriate the land be put to beneficial use by the people who live, work in Marin. Uh, Al writes in, uh, Al says, what makes you think prime real estate with million dollar views is the right place to be able to build affordable housing. Uh, the city of Larkspur already rejected uh, former uh, Supervisor Kinsey's proposal for San Quentin development. Just let San Quentin be San Rafael's answer to Tiburon. So look, I, I think here's my bottom line and I'll uh, turn it over to anyone else that wants to comment. Um, affordable housing uh, makes our community vibrant. Uh, literally, we're trying to house teachers. Teachers are teaching our kids, folks who are checking us out at Safeway, those who are responding as a paramedic in our time of need. Um, we should all want to rally uh, around a development that's going to help keep folks who are working in Marin, in Marin, and being able to live and raise their family here. Um, look, my bottom line is this. Uh, will there be changes this development based off of community feedback? Absolutely. But if we take a look at the great need, especially here in the North Bay area for this type of housing that's going to be able to provide teachers and classified support, county workers who are uh, doing the job, keeping our streets open day in and day out during these storms and wildfires, we should want to be able to go the extra mile for them. And I completely agree, Al, this, these uh, uh, units will have 
million dollar views and it should be shared with everyone, not just those who can build a million dollar home. My own personal opinion, but anybody else wants to uh, chime in on this? Uh, Teddy, uh, superintendent, superintendent's ready to go. Oh, sorry. So I, I would totally agree with you. And I think who better uh, than that should have that great view than the people that are doing so much for our community um, in a myriad of roles as essential workers. Are they the people that are making the difference? So I think of anyone who deserves the great view, um, I would say particularly these essential workers, which include our amazing teachers who are very tired at the end of a long day because they work um, tirelessly on behalf of the children of others. Why not have them be the ones that get to rest with a great view? That's Mary Jane Burke, County Superintendent of Schools. I'm gonna turn it back over to the assemblyman. Assemblyman, I don't know if you wanna comment on this one specific uh, comment that came in and I'll turn it back over to you for any questions or comments that you have. Well, I've got some pretty uh, fairly radical views about what's appropriate at San Quentin, um, which to me also includes a state prison. We place a high value on incarceration in this state, perversely perhaps, but the fact that we uh, have people that need rehabilitation um, and that we have people who are donating their time, their talent and their skill going into that prison to help rehabilitate others who would live close by. It's not possible in uh, Tulare County, in Kern County, and other parts of the state, but it is possible right here where many people say uh, within the prison system that San Quentin is like the Harvard of our prison system, that you gotta go to San Quentin if you wanna get some of the best rehabilitative services. So to think that we are just carving off a small slice of that property for people that work in our schools is uh, is great and is an opportunity we can't pass up. And if it wasn't clear, I'm an unabashed a fan of this project. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't give it scrutiny and we shouldn't ask hard questions, that we shouldn't expect the very best for our community and for our teachers and support staff that are going to live there. Which is why I was asking questions about making sure if they have a problem with plumbing, that that's going to get listened to and that's going to get solved because I don't want uh, school teachers living with mold or fungus, or worse. Um, and so that's my, my very short take on that one, Senator. Um, so we've got some interesting questions. Ashley is concerned about HOAs uh, and, I, and suggesting that perhaps, you know, HOAs could be discriminatory or something like that. And I don't, I don't know how that would play into something like this development. Um, but certainly as I have expressed concerns about the tenants there, um, is there any type of a, you know, this is very early on, I guess they could self-organize and create bylaws of a tenants um, organization, but have you seen something like that before that works against the discrimination that Ashley is concerned about, but also make sure that the concerns of the tenants are heard and realized or not realized, but resolved? I think that homeowners associations are generally associated with um, for sale housing, uh, condominium or uh, uh for sale communities. Um, a hundred percent of this project is rental. So there are not going to be, there's not going to be a HOA. And, but has there any been something like that in a, a tenant situation where they have, uh, you know, an association, you know, they can, I know some people that live in places that have, you know, social functions, they've got an organization that helps them plan for those types of things, gives a voice to, to people who live there. Um, our community uh, managers will certainly do that, but um, relative to uh, uh, informal association, I'm not familiar with anything like that at our properties, but uh, Teddy? We, <clears throat> sorry, we, we do a lot. Uh, we, we have our uh, community managers, which obviously are always there to, to take uh, input from our, from our uh, residents. We also have uh, service, uh, service managers on site. Um, which, which serve, serve a similar function, but often represent the needs of the, uh, the residents even more. Um, and we do, we do have some properties where uh, I believe residents organize a little more, but we, we do, I think, at least annual surveys of all our residents, um, mm -hmm. which, which the whole company reviews and, and, uh, and responds to any, any concerns that these residents might have. So I think that um, in terms of larger organizations, uh, Organizing, uh, we haven't seen that as necessary from our tenants' perspective, but we're we're always open to taking their their input. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we had a question about, you know, we're talking about this specific site and you, you've talked about a couple of other places that have occurred across the Bay area too, but perhaps Jason, you can share with us where else is this occurring? Um, I think it's important for people to know that either this wonderful opportunity or this pox upon us, uh, you know, isn't just occurring for us. Um, you know, we're finding places to house uh, people who need housing all across California and in the Bay Area. Do you have a, a can, are you able to give a, a, you know, a little bit of a list of places that are dealing with this too? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have uh, about 17 developments in some stage uh, uh, underway right now. Um, like I said, another 80 or so sites that are in the queue for us. Um, we have uh, projects that are very small, um, you know, micro units in Sacramento. We have Stock the city of Stockton's first ever multifamily modular project. We've got much, much larger sites. Uh, the San Joaquin County Fairgrounds is under solicitation right now. That would be between 110 acres or 250 acres. Uh, we have a project in Clear Lake, Placerville, Reedley, Riverside, uh, San Fran, uh, South Lake Tahoe, um, Truckee. Uh, we have solicitations out uh, for LA, um, another project in Sacramento and uh, Gilroy. Um, and again, more kind of in the works, we're looking at something rather large in San Diego as well. Um, all of our sites are a little different. Some are much larger, some are much smaller, um, but this is something that the administration has really leaned into and really, like I said at the beginning, making sure that we're utilizing excess state property in, in the most you know conducive way to housing. And so, yeah, that's, it's a full blown program. We're very excited. And um, you know, all of our sites, I think, are, are something that the state can be proud of. All right, Jason, you've probably never been as busy as you are now with all of that in the queue. Um, I, I want to drop by and, you know, hear about how this is all going um, sometime. But uh, Chris asked a question. It's somewhat like a little bit of an existential question um, about the Bay Area economy, how it's just burst and grown exponentially um, and that, you know, it's causing the need for more housing. And, and he, you know, he, he was somewhat, I think, dissatisfied about the conversation is either, you know, we don't want this here or why is it here? Um, but I think what's really fascinating is we, we don't control our borders in California. Um, anyone can come and go as they please. Um, so goodbye, Elon Musk. Uh, enjoy yourself in Texas. But uh, his employees are still staying here in California and they're still hiring more people to work at Tesla in California. So, you know, the, the, the headline of, uh, of what he's doing is causing a lot of rubbernecking heads going the wrong direction when uh, his business is growing here. Um, and we, we don't really have a lot of control about, you know, your neighbor's business that's taking off, so to speak. So there is job growth in California and it's one heck of a desirable place to be. Um, let's just be honest. So people want, they're naturally drawn to come to California. So we have this huge population growth, um, but we, haven't really had a lot of, uh, you know, housing development for any number of reasons. Um, the Great Recession really set back uh, starts for housing starts. It also really tightened the financing for people. So it was difficult to afford housing if it was being built. Um, and then we have a lot of other structural uh, issues um, as well. So I think, you know, rather than throw that on our panel, I did want to at least recognize Chris's question and that puts a lot of pressure on Senator McGuire and me to try to figure out, well, how do we deal with this? Because um, we know people who don't have um, permanent housing, people who are struggling for that. And I, I want to share a story. I was in San Bernardino uh, two weeks ago looking at a Project Home Key site, and I met a woman who, for the first time in six years, has custody of her two children because she never had stable housing until now. And I mean, that, that just warmed my heart, uh, made me feel proud of the work that we're doing in, in this state uh, and so glad for her children whom I met and they were adorable. And if we can't be for that, I, I don't know what we're for. Um, I, you know, I already had supported that program, but I you know whatever we can do to, especially after this past weekend, to get a warm roof over more more families' heads, uh, we we got to we got to be for that. Um, and so I'm grateful. Uh, of course, this is a state project, so I'm I'm grateful to the Department of General Services, which reports to Governor Newsom, 
but they are working so well with our local governments and we, I wanna encourage more of that. I'm also grateful for the partnership with Senator McGuire to have this bicameral, bicameral oversight uh, of this state project is extraordinarily important. And I, then I think, you know, what really brings this thing home is, uh, is that the county and the, the Office of Education are gonna own this. This is gonna be a local project in the end. Uh, we're taking ownership of this um, and I couldn't be more proud of that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Assemblymember. Member. We're gonna be winding down here in just a few moments. We'll be asking uh, closing comments from each of our panelists. We have just three quick uh, comments, questions, uh, a couple that will be going to our nonprofit housing developers and then one to uh, Superintendent Burke. Uh, this comes in from Karen. Uh, Karen writes in, are there considerations? And again, a lot of questions tonight about traffic and public transportation infrastructure, rightfully so, right? So Karen says, are there considerations about transportation infrastructure around the locations where these units are going up? San Quentin doesn't have a lot of roads in and out. I'm not a Republican, but I'm retired, tax to death, longtime resident in the Bay Area. And I'm concerned that we are going to have a come one, come all program. I volunteer locally with an organization that furnishes apartments for previously homeless people. So I'm sympathetic to this cause. I, I think it's really clear though, to distinguish this project is gonna be focused on uh, teachers, classified staff, essential workers. This is not a homeless development. Um, it, it's truly those folks who keep our communities running each and every day. But let's get to the issue of public transportation. Bruce, Teddy, I, I think we're gonna to need to be able to look at a potential enhancement of minimum of some type of Marin County transit bus stop. I know that's gonna be a conversation that we're gonna to need to have with local governments, but I think that's gonna be critical uh, for this development. Bruce, Teddy, uh, I think this is something that we're gonna to need to be able to look at as we move forward. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think, I think you uh, you said it really well, and it's, it's something that we're thinking about as we do these transit studies, um, looking at how we can how we can better access the existing transit. If there's things we can do to uh, to increase transit in the area, um, you know, again, as we as we've said, we are gonna we're figuring out a, a connection to the uh, to the walking the pedestrian and, and bike path, and, and I think that will help. But I also think if there's bus stay, bus stops that we can put um, in the area uh, to increase ridership, or very supportive of that and can work that into our project. Thank you so much, Teddy Newmeyer. Teddy Newmeyer is going to speak for uh, Mr. Dorfman on that one. Uh, we are going to go to our next comment, and this is coming in from Ann. Ann says, the need for affordable housing in Marin has never been greater. The current, quote, housing wage or the hourly wage needed to afford a one-bedroom apartment without experiencing rent burden, that's defined as spending more than 30% of income on rent, assuming a 40-hour work week, this is 300% higher than a minimum wage. I'm a resident of Larkspur and live adjacent to the proposed development site and in favor of this project. So a comment there from Ann. Uh, and as the assembly member and I said, we are taking all comments tonight uh, and criticisms. And I'm gonna go to a comment um, and it's a bit inflammatory, but I think we need to be able to address it because um, I'll just be candid. Uh, I don't believe this is accurate. Uh, and I want the superintendent to address this because it's inflammatory and we need to set the record straight. Nancy comes in and says, we pay large uh, add-on property taxes to keep small class and less small classes and less crowded school facilities. Why are we doing this when we're being overwhelmed now with more kids from this housing and the hundreds of new migrants being brought to Marin in excessive numbers, diluting the quality of our schools, which we have paid dearly for. I'm just gonna be blunt and I'm gonna be 30 seconds. Okay, great. Uh, so to be- Go ahead, please. Oh, you're being blunt. No, you, I'm encouraging you to be blunt. Okay, I'm, I'm good to be blunt. So um, one of the great things about the public schools is that all children are welcome. There's no questions asked, whether regardless of abilities, disabilities, where they came from, you know, whoever they are. And that is what makes public schools public schools, in my view, is the ability to have everyone come in. And so just know that when we serve the most vulnerable children in our community, it is better for all of us. And I will tell you that if you take the time to walk into one of our amazing public schools and look at all the children and the diversity that's there in all areas, uh, you will be proud not only proud, you will want to ensure that we continue with this level of diversity in this great county. And 
uh, Superintendent Burke, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but a lot of districts are seeing declining enrollment. Uh, not all, but many in, in Marin and in Sonoma and in San Francisco because uh, folks simply can't afford to live here. Um, and I think that's been one of the biggest challenges. We're not seeing a huge influx of students year in and year out coming into Marin or the North Bay, but you want to set the record straight, Superintendent? Yeah, definitely. So um, every every school district in Marin County has seen a decline, a decline in enrollment. So that's this year's data. Um, and our hope, uh, frankly, is that we get more of those students back. I'm not sure you know, if we lost some of these students during the COVID era, but the statewide trend is a decline in enrollment overall. So you're right, Senator. All right, that's Superintendent Mayor Jane Burke of Marin County Schools. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask for closing comments from each of our panelists, uh, 30 seconds, and then we're gonna turn it over to Assemblyman Mark Levine to be able to close this out tonight. I just wanna say thank you so much, all of you for joining us. Thank you for hanging with us. We're almost an hour and a half in. Let me just make a commitment, and this is something that is so important to the assembly member and myself. This is not going to be the last time that we're gonna be with you. We're gonna come back to you in the spring to be able to respond to the comments, to the feedback that were that was advanced here tonight. In addition, uh, both nonprofit housing developers will be working directly with the neighbors. Uh, they'll be working directly with the city and the county to be able to help mold this project as they go forward. This is not the last. This is the first time, first formal opportunity that we're going to be talking together, coming together to talk about this proposed new neighborhood. I know that Mr. Dorfman and Mr. Newmeyer is going to make, they'll make themselves available, their entire team available uh, to the neighbors of this site, to the city of Larkspur, of course, to the county of Marin. And this is just the beginning of the conversation. We're very early on this process. And again, we want to say thank you to each and every one of you for joining. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Burke, then we're going to go to Mr. Dorfman, Mr. Kinney, Mr. Newmeyer, then I'm going to give it to the assembly member to close this out tonight. Superintendent, closing comment, please. Sure, sure. So just to say, this is a partnership, obviously. And um, what's going to happen because of the strong relationships and partnerships we have in the county is that great things are going to happen for our school employees as well as county employees. And I look forward to the day that we're um, at the ribbon cutting ceremony. The superintendent is ready to get that hard hat on and start building. Absolutely. So thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go to Jason Kinney, Department of General Services, representing the state agency that is uh, in charge of all real estate transactions and this uh, land deal. Mr. Kinney, 30 seconds, please. Yeah. Um, you know, Governor Newsom has really leaned into addressing the state housing crisis. And this is one of many paths towards that end. I think it's really clear that this project can do so much good in the area. I'm grateful to have such a qualified development team behind it. And I, I think it's exciting. And I'm, I'm, I'm also really grateful that we have such staunch housing partners in Assembly Member Levine and Senator McGuire. I'm looking forward to seeing this project continue to develop and to seeing the community's increased input and, and, and hopefully uh, large scale support and uh, to be there at that ribbon cutting with the superintendent. Thank you so much, Mr. Kinney. Uh, we're very grateful. Mr. Dorfman, uh, Mr. Newmeyer, we'll go to you. Mr. Dorfman, in your closing comment, if you could please uh, give out the email again if folks want to get in touch with you. Uh, I think that's going to be important. Mr. Dorfman, 30 seconds, please. Sure. Uh, well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you and Assemblymember Levine for hosting this meeting. It's been a great opportunity to uh, introduce this project to the community. Uh, but for 20 years, we've been working with school districts uh, on this issue, and, uh, and specifically in Maroon County. Um, we're grateful that we have this opportunity. We think that uh, by partnering with MCOE and uh, the county, we'll be able to see this project through uh, fruition. Again, our website for this project is oakhillmarin.com. And any questions or any information that you're looking for, uh, please register online and we will respond to you. And uh, again, we uh, cherish input. So uh, the more, the better. And Mr. Dorfman, I think Assembly Member and I would not be uh, flipped to say it doesn't take a formal meeting for communication. You're going to continue reaching out the neighbors as well, correct, Mr. Dorfman? Correct. All right, thank you so much. Teddy Newmeyer, Eden Housing, 30 seconds closing comment, please. Yeah, not much more to add, but I, I do want to thank uh, Senator McGuire, uh, Assemblymember Levine for, for their hard work and support for this project. You know, we, I think that uh, 
this work is hard and the state support opening up this land has been incredibly beneficial. Uh, Jason Kennedy and his team have been incredibly helpful and, and we appreciate their support as we push forward with this. Um, again, uh, to, to reiterate what Bruce said, um, we, we look forward to, to answering these questions more in depth as we get more information ourselves. Um, Oak Hill Marin, oakhillmarin.com is a great place to find information and sign up for future uh, future notices and, and info. And, and I appreciate everyone who stuck with us and, and appreciate everyone's support. Tiffany Newmar, thank you so much. We also want to say thank you to Carrie, Summer, Anna, Rebecca, Carlene, and Abby who are behind the scenes along with Rich, assembly member who have been helping be able to make this community meeting possible. We're very grateful. Assembly member, I'm going to turn it over to you to close this out tonight. And we look forward to getting back together with you, of course, in the spring and continuing our work together on this important project. Thank you, Senator McGuire. Thanks for, for all of the, the staff that organized this. Of course, this great panel. Last live question. I just got it from my kids. They asked, Dad, why is this taking so long? <laughs> so I'll tell you why. This is the most consequential affordable housing opportunity for Marin County in generations. But it's important we get it right. And I'm just so grateful for this panel, for their commitment to listening to all of these questions, for having a website structure to facilitate more community input, more feedback, more uh, questions to be asked, because as this goes on, we'll have more questions about this. So, um, you know, this is a, a commitment um, and an opportunity at the same time. So again, my gratitude to, to the entire panel and of course to DGS and, and Jason Kenny um, for just being such a good partner with our local community. To everyone who's uh, kept with us, um, thank you for participating. Thank you for the questions, the thoughtful questions, all of them really were uh, that you submitted, but also came in live. Uh, that, that helps us do our job. We don't get elected and suddenly know everything uh, without your input. We, we become empowered uh, on your behalf to do our work. So thank you all so much for that. Have a wonderful evening.